Hi guys, good evening. I am Elon. Online Axie.com person for teaching zoology. So last class we have started the molecular basis of inheritance. How far the characters being inherited from the parents to the young ones. So we are talking about at the molecular level namely the DNA. And we are considering the genetic material either DNA or RNA. Suppose DNA or, DNA or RNA is being considered as a genetic material and what are the qualities of genetic material? If you are considering a particular material as a genetic material, it should have four important characteristics. Number one, replication. Number two, that is stability. Number three, mutation. And number four, expression. The last class we talked about the previous three characteristics of a genetic material namely the mutation, the replication, as well as what we have the stability. So in that one we came to know the DNA is more stable than that of RNA because of certain characteristics. Now the fourth important characteristics of a genetic material is its expression. You know each and every phenotypic character is nothing but the ultimate expression of the gene. The gene is the unit, the ultimate unit for the expression of any character of any individual, either plant or an animal. So, one of the important characteristics of the genetic material, it should be able to express itself in the form of what is called the Mendelian characteristics or the now in the form of Mendelian characters. See, a Mendelian character, as per the Mendelian character, it comes under monogenic inheritance. A particular gene is responsible for the expression of a particular character. That is what is called a Mendelian character. It is also called qualitative inheritance, also called monogenic inheritance. Now, if you are comparing RNA and DNA, as RNA contains a genetic code, it can directly code for the synthesis of a protein or a polypeptide. Hence, it expresses the character directly. But in the case of DNA, so without RNA, it cannot express itself because the message in the DNA has been transcribed in RNA and it is RNA that is responsible for carrying the message to the ribosome where it is being translated to form a specific protein. So there is a direct expression of characters by the RNA but the DNA is dependent on RNA, dependent on RNA for its expression. You will be seeing this one later and the chapter transcription and translation process. So these are all the four important characteristics of a genetic material. So of the two genetic materials DNA or RNA, the DNA is being more stable. That is why it is, it is being better for the storage of genetic information. It is being preferred by the scientists or it is being preferred by the cell, you know that one, as per the stability, as it is being more stable. It is meant for the storage of genetic information. But for RNA, it is better for the transmission of characters because the message in the mRNA can be directly expressed to form a particular protein or polypeptide which is being expressed as a particular specific phenotype. So, out of the two genetic materials DNA and RNA, DNA is meant for the storage of genetic information an RNA is meant for the transmission of characters for the genetic information. Just actually as it has the ability of directly coding for the synthesis of proteins. So these are the two main uh, genetic materials have their both similarities and differences. Now we have to know, so far we study actually the main genetic material DNA, the structural aspects etc, the double helical structure. And this genetic material DNA has to be actually work only in the presence of another genetic material or it may also work in the form of non-genetic material. So that is nothing but the ribonucleic acid or RNA. So in some cases, in some organisms, you will see one by one, the RNA is acting as a genetic material where you have no DNA, for example in the case of viruses. But in the case of organisms having DNA as a genetic material, the RNA doesn't play a role of genetic material, but it is responsible for protein synthesis and also responsible for carrying out various metabolic processes 
under the influence of DNA. So, the RNA is also acting as a genetic material in some viruses, in the case of plants, in the case of animals, and also in the case of just some organisms. But in most cases, we have the DNA as a genetic material. So, without the help of RNA, the DNA cannot express its character. So that's why we have now something about another giant molecule, namely the ribonucleic acid. You know that one out of the two, RNA and DNA, which was the first genetic material that was noted down, that was discovered. So the RNA is the first genetic material normally it was known. Next only we came to know about just the DNA as a genetic material. So don't forget, RNA was the first genetic material known to mankind. And what is its function? It is doing a number of functions. It is responsible for example the life processes like metabolism, then translation of the message and also the splicing. All these events are evolved around RNA. So what do you mean by splicing? It's related. So most of the activities are involved directly just with RNA with the help of DNA. Now normally the RNA is not only acting as a genetic material, it is also acting as a catalyst. That is why it is unstable. I mentioned already one of the important properties of stability of genetic material. The DNA is more stable because it is non catalytic in nature. Whereas the RNA is always act as a catalyst. As it is a catalyst, it is being reactive. That is why it is unstable. So whenever a particular material is acting as a catalyst, it is always reactive. And that is why it is unstable. So as RNA is acting as a genetic material as well as a catalyst, it becomes more reactive. It's more reactive. That is why it becomes unstable. So the reactive nature is because of you know its catalytic activity. So whenever a material is more reactive, it is unstable. So when compared to DNA, it is actually unstable. One of the reasons for unstability because of its catalytic nature, that is why it's reactive. Now we have to know the molecular structure of RNA. As we study the molecular structure of DNA, it is a double stranded structure. So unlike the DNA, actually this RNA, a genetic material, also acting as a non-genetic material. So it is also universally present in all organisms. Universally present in all organisms, except in structures or some organisms where DNA is a genetic material. So, for example, DNA viruses. So, accepting DNA viruses, where you have the DNA is present as a genetic material, the RNA is absent. So, excluding the DNA viruses, RNA is normally or universally present in all organisms. Then, what is the chemical nature of this RNA? It is normally a single polynucleotide strand. In all cases, it is in the form of a single polynucleotide strand unlike the double helical structure of DNA where you have the DNA is made up of a double strand structure but here it is made up of single polynucleotide strand it may be folded in some cases it may be in the form of straight chain etc we'll see another structure of different kinds of all now in all cases I mentioned it is a single polynucleotide strand but in two viruses one the Rio virus and also in wound tumor virus. So it is in the form of double standard RNA. It is in the form of double standard RNA. So DS RNA. Double standard RNA. DS RNA. So in the case of retroviruses, also we have two strands of RNA, but they are not considered as double standard structure. So they are called as the diploid viruses because they have two separate strands of RNA. But in the case of Rio virus and wound tumor virus, we have double stranded RNA. So there are two strands lying parallel to each. But in the case of uh, retroviruses like AIDS virus, though we have two strands of RNA, they are not present as a double stranded structure. That is why such viruses are called diploid viruses. Viruses having single or actually you can see two identical strands of RNA two identical strands of RNA not double standard two identical strands of RNA they are called diploid viruses 
But in the case of real virus and wounded tumor virus, we have double stranded RNA. Okay, so that is a peculiar condition. In all cases, it is always existing in the form of single polynucleotide strand. Now, as it is being formed of single nucleotide strand, there is no complementarity because it is being formed of only one strand. So, there is no complementarity, there is no base pairing. So, there is no 1 is to 1 ratio. There is no 1 is to 1 ratio between the purines and the pyrimidines. As it is a single standard structure, there is no complementarity, that is, there is no pairing of bases. That is why we can say there is no 1 is to 1 ratio between the purines and pyrimidines. That is, there is no, that is what is called actually 1 is to 1 ratio, meaning that one, the number of purines is not equal to the number of pyrimidines. As in the case of uh, as in the case of what is called DNA, here it is the number of purine is not equal to the number of pyrimidines as there is no complementarity, as there is no base pairing, that is because it is a single standard structure. Now you are given a simple structure of RNA as in the case of DNA. So it is also being formed of nucleotides, what I mentioned earlier. There are four types of nucleotides which join together to form a polynucleotide chain. So it is also formed of nucleoside to which added the phosphoric acid. I mentioned already adenosine, guanosine, thiamine, and then also sorry, uridine and cytine in the case of RNA. These are all the nucleosides. When phosphoric acid is added, we have adenosine monophosphate, guanosine monophosphate then cytidine monophosphate and uridine monophosphate. So these are the four types of nucleotides formed in the case of RNA. Adenosine monophosphate, guanosine monophosphate, uridine monophosphate and cytidine monophosphate. So in place of thiamidine phosphate, we have uridine phosphate here. Then again we have in place of deoxyribose sugar as in DNA. Here we have the ribose sugar. Now this is the molecular structure of ribose sugar, what is it already? We have at the second corner atom, there is an attachment of hydroxyl group and because of this hydroxyl group only it is being very reactive. That is why it is labile and is easily degenerable. This is because of the presence of hydroxyl group. As in the case of DNA, here also the phosphoric acid forms a phosphodiester bond between the fifth and third carbon atoms of the two successive sugars. And again we have N1 glycosidic linkage between the nitrogen base and the sugar molecule. This is what is called N1 glycosidic linkage. Then because the sugar is connected to the adjacent sugar by a mix of phosphodiester linkage. This is what is happening. This is one nucleotide as in the case of DNA. Here it is called guanosine monophosphate or <coughs> guanylic acid. Gonylic acid, just like adenylic acid, it is called gonylic acid or gonosine monophosphate GMP. So, in most cases, you know that for energy for replication process for DNA has been provided by gonosine triphosphate. Gonosine triphosphate. So, gonosine monophosphate is a nucleotide. Two more phosphates are added to form gonosine triphosphate, which is a source of energy for replication process. It not only acts as a source of energy for replication process, it also acts as a substrate, a nucleotide for the formation of a, a nucleotide, polynucleotide chain. Now what are the different types of RNA? So in the case of viruses where we have DNA as a genetic material, I mentioned already, we have normally the RNA is not a genetic material where you have the DNA. So we have different types of RNA and before entering into this one, so what is the nature of this RNA in different individuals? I will mention that one, we will go back once again. After the expression, we have the RNA. So I mentioned about this RNA is the genetic material in some cases. So accepting this real virus etc. Say in the case of tobacco mosaic virus, we have RNA as the genetic material. In the case of some animal viruses, for example, the one which causes measles, the mumps, then we have also the German measles, etc., where you have RNA as the genetic material. 
But in the case of our bacteriophages, all bacteriophages exclusively contain DNA as a genetic material. So no bacteriophage contains RNA as a genetic material. Remember this one, so we'll go back. Now what are the types of RNA? We can say simply non-genetic RNA. When we are talking about the types of RNA, and these RNAs are not acting as a genetic material in terms of types, but they are concerned with one process by name protein synthesis. So these RNAs are found in the case of cells where you have the DNA as a genetic material. That is fine. We can say these RNAs as non-genetic RNA. Non-genetic RNA. So I am talking about the different types of RNA. As they are not doing the function of genetic material, but performing some other function, namely protein synthesis, these RNAs are generally called as non-genetic RNAs. Now, what are the different types of RNA? Number one, messenger RNA or mRNA. Number two, the reversible RNA or RRNA. Number three, just you have the transfer RNA, tRNA, also called as soluble RNA, also considered as an adaptive molecule. Then we have the heterogeneous nuclear RNA. Heterogeneous nuclear RNA. It is nothing but pre mRNA. It is nothing but pre mRNA. Before mRNA being processed, it is called heterogeneous nuclear RNA. It is nothing but pre mRNA. Before it attained maturity, before it is being processed, the mRNA is otherwise called as heterogeneous nuclear RNA as it contains both coding and non-coding sequences in the case of eukaryotic cells. After it has been processed, then it is called messenger RNA. So before it has been processed, it is called heterogeneous nuclear RNA or before maturation. Or after maturation, after processing has been completed, it is called messenger RNA. Then another one, small nuclear RNA or SN RNA. So it is normally acting as a catalyst. In the case of one complex, what is called spliceosome, I will tell you more about later. So anyway, these are all the five different types of RNAs found in a cell concerned with doing some activities. And normally the RNAs are being produced by the enzyme RNA polymerase. So in the case of actually prokaryotic cell, there is only one RNA polymerase for the synthesis of all the types of RNA. In prokaryotic cells, bacteria, there is only one RNA polymerase, an enzyme, responsible for the synthesis of all the different types of RNA. But in the case of eukaryotic cells, we have three different types of polymerase enzymes. Polymerase 1, polymerase 2, polymerase 3. For example, this reversible RNA being synthesized by polymerase 1. We will be talking about later once again in the transcription. And that's messenger RNA being synthesized by polymerase 2 and the transfer RNA being synthesized by 3. And also this heterogeneous nuclear RNA as it is nothing but free mRNA, it is being synthesized by 2. And this one small nuclear RNA being synthesized by that is what is called polymerase 3. So different polymerase enzymes are taking part in synthesizing different types of RNA. But in the case of prokaryotic cells like bacteria, there is only one polymerase for the synthesis of all the different types of, that is, RNAs. Now let's see the different characteristics of all these types of RNA. The first one, let's say a messenger RNA. So it is nothing but a single polynucleotide chain, unfolded chain. It is in the form of unfolded chain, being made up of few hundred nucleotides being made up of few hundred nucleotides. So it is in the form of a long chain, a linear form, unfolded form, actually formed of few hundred nucleotides. And how is it normally synthesized? So it is being synthesized by means of a process from the DNA template, what is called the transcription process. So during transcription, the message in DNA being copied as a mRNA. Then what it is called as mRNA as it carries a message, which is being printed, which is being transcribed in it. So the copying of mRNA on DNA strand is called transcription process. 
So the mRNA is normally synthesized in the nucleus from a DNA template by a process called transcription. Don't forget this one. It is being synthesized in the nucleus from DNA template by a process of transcription. Then what is its molecular weight? So it is a next high molecular weight compared to the R RNA or reversible RNA. So its molecular weight is about 5,000, sorry, 5 lakh dollars. Molecular weight is about 5 lakh dollars. And what is its actually half life period or what is its life duration, the lifespan? So it is normally this messenger RNA is short lived. When compared to the different types of RNA, it is being short lived. So in the case of prokaryotic cells, its life activity, its duration is only 2 minutes. But in the case of eukaryotic cells, its life duration or life activity is 4 hours. So, it lives for 2 minutes in the case of prokaryotic cells like bacteria and 4 hours in the case of eukaryotic cells. So, there is a main difference between the life duration. That's why I say, out of the different types of RNAs, it is of short way. And second, it is also unstable when compared to the different types. It is more unstable. As soon as its function gets over, just after transferring the message, the site of protein synthesis, it has been cleaned. It has been broken into pieces. Once again, the materials are into us. That is why the lifespan is very short. So it is unstable and the lifespan is very short also. It is also unfolded. It is in the form of long chain when compared to other types of RNAs. Now, what is its percentage above the total cellular form? So it is the least in percentage when compared to other types. So in terms of common also it is least in percentage 5 to 10 percent of the total cellular RNA unlike the reversible RNA the most abundant the next comes we have the tRNA the least abundant is nothing but that is what is all this R uh, that is mRNA mRNA constitutes nearly 5 to 10 percent of the total cellular RNA as I mentioned it is highly unstable as soon as its function is over so its function is nothing but carrying the message are carrying the genetic information from the DNA to the site of protein synthesis which is considered as the protein factory where you have the synthesis of proteins taking place. So the message has been transferred from the DNA to the ribosome by means of this one. So anyway its function is concerned with the protein synthesis by way of carrying message from the DNA template to what is called the ribosome, the place of protein synthesis. Now the next type of RNA, the transfer RNA, also called a soluble RNA, also called as an adapted molecule. It is considered as an adapted molecule, hence the name adapted RNA. As it is, it is an adapter for the what is called the amino acid to be carried towards the protein synthesis site. That is why it is called as an adapted molecule. The concept was made by Francis Crick. So tRNA as an adapted molecule has been put forth by Watson Creek, sorry, Creek one. The nature of tRNA as an adapted molecule was first put forth by, that is a phosphate, just by Creek. Now, it is normally shorter in length, the smallest RNA, because it is having only 80 to 90 nucleotides. It's a short chain, but it is in a folded form, unlike the mRNA where it is unfolded. It is of longest one somehow, but here it is and just this one is folded in nature, having only few, having a few nucleotides only. That is, it is of the smallest in size when compared to the rest of the RNAs. So it has even a less molecular weight. There you have five lakh here only twenty five thousand because it contains only a few number of molecules, namely the polynucleotides or some of the nucleotides. It is of smallest in size, having low molecular weight. And what about the amount? In total cellular RNA, it is somewhat higher in percentage when compared to mRNA, where you have only 5 to 10 percent only, but here it constitutes nearly 15 percent of the total cellular RNA. 15 percent of the total cellular RNA. So, what is its function? It is also taking part in protein synthesis, but its main function is carrying amino acid from the cytoplasm, from the amino acid pool of cytoplasm to the factory, namely the protein factory synthesis or protein synthesis factory we can say 
the ribosome. That is why it is called as an adapted molecule acid carries amino acid, providing just the space for the attachment of amino acid and carrying the amino acid to the site of protein synthesis. It is called as the adapted molecule. So messenger RNA carries information, the genetic information, whereas a tRNA carries the amino acid to the site of protein synthesis, where it is being translated the message and as a result, the protein synthesis takes place in the protein factory of the cell, namely that is ribosome. As I mentioned earlier, tRNA as an adapted molecule, that concept was put forth by Francis Crick. So he normally just postulated the presence of an adapted molecule, namely the tRNA. That adapted molecule has actually has the ability of reading the message in the form of code by mRNA. So this molecule would on one hand, so it has a dual function. It has the ability of reading the code that is carried by mRNA and also it has the ability of binding with amino acid just formed in the cytoplasm. So, the postulate normally proposed by Francis Crick stated that the presence of an adaptive molecule that would on one hand normally read the code of mRNA, on another hand just that would bind with the amino acid. So it is carrying the code or sorry, it is carrying the message or it is carrying what is called a triplet base in the form anticolon. That anticolon can read the message of the mRNA that is what is called code. That is why written here like that. On one hand read the code of mRNA. On another hand it would bind with what is called amino acid as an adaptive molecule. So that concept was proposed by Francis Crick. So, actually, formerly this tRNA was called a soluble RNA. And that RNA was normally known even before the genetic code was postulated and disappeared. Before that, this, before that actually what is called the code has been disappeared. This concept of adaptive molecule, the tRNA, soluble RNA, was known to public. So, its nature of adaptive molecule has been as an only later period. So, even before the genetic code was known, the 64 codons, genetic code, this tRNA was known first and then only we came to know about the different types of genetic code and its nature as adapted molecule has been assigned only at a later period after the formation of after what we call the this genetic code has been disappeared. Now, let's see the structure of this one. And if you are kind of just counting the number of tRNAs, as we have different types of amino acids, nearly about 20 different types of amino acids, corresponding to the 20 different types of amino acids, we are not having exactly 20 types of tRNA for amino acids, but we have more than 20 types of tRNAs. In a cell, we have more than 20 different types of tRNAs, as we have 20 amino acids, at least one tRNA for carrying an amino acid. So, we have assumed that there are more than 20 different types of tRNAs. Different types. So, but if you are taking in back this cell, so the minimum number 20, the maximum may be 70. There are more than 70 tRNAs in the case of prokaryotic cells. But the number is somewhat higher in the case of eukaryotic cells. The number is even great in the case of eukaryotic cells. So, at least we need 20 different types of tRNAs for carrying the 20 different types of amino acids. But in a cell, we have more than 20 different types of actual tRNAs. In the case of prokaryotic cell, a minimum of 70 tRNAs are present for just carrying 20 different types of amino acids. In the case of eukaryotic cell, the number is even greater. We have just more than 100 tRNAs for carrying 20 different amino acids. So from this one, one can able to know there is more than one tRNA for an amino acid. In some cases, the tRNA is specific for only one amino acid. But in some cases, there are more than four or five tRNAs specific for a particular amino acid. If there are more than two or three or four tRNAs specific for a particular amino acid, so they can have actually the anticolon, they can actually attach only one type of amino acid 
then incorporating that amino acid during protein synthesis. Such a tRNA is two or three or four or more than four was actually specific for one amino acid or called isoacceptor tRNAs. Isoacceptor tRNAs. So the meaning for that one. So tRNAs. Suppose for example we have five tRNAs. These five tRNAs have different anticodons. But all are responsible for incorporating a specific amino acid during protein synthesis. If you have four tRNAs carrying anticodon for attachment with only one amino acid, and these tRNAs are called isoacceptor tRNAs. For example, for amino acid serine, this is only one specific amino acid, but there are six tRNAs for carrying this serine. Though they have different anticodons, and these anticodons are actually complementary to the codon of mRNA. But they are all responsible for incorporating only one type of amino acid in protein synthesis. That's why they are called isoacceptor tRNAs. Different tRNAs having different codons, but specific for only one amino acid. Same example here. There are six tRNAs for amino acid serine. Such tRNAs are called isoacceptor tRNAs. All these tRNAs are responsible for carrying only one amino acid as here the example. There are six tRNAs for the amino acid serum. They are called isoacceptor tRNAs for serine. Now, what is the nature of the structure of tRNA? What is the nature of the structure of tRNA? So, a structural model was proposed by a person by name, Hurley, in 1961. He proposed a leaf model, what is called clover leaf model of TR. He proposed a clover leaf model of TR. So, the mRNA is unfolded. But this tRNA has become folded. Because of the folding process, the tRNA assumes the shape of what is called clover leaf, a legume. A clover is nothing but a legume plant. That concept was made by R. W. Hurley in 1965. So actually what will happen, a single standard RNA gets folded to form a clover leaf model. So by means of folding, normally the tRNA assumes what is called the clover leaf model. The clover leaf model. So that is because of the folding. Then how many foldings are there in the tRNA molecule to attain this clover leaf structure? There are three foldings or three folds in the tRNA to just giving the structure of clover leaf. The normally in actual practice, the tRNA is nothing but a compact molecule looking like an inverted L. It is looking like an inverted L, just like seven. So it is a compact molecule in a normal arrangement. So it looks like what is called an inverted L. But because of the folding, this is actually generally an apparent structure what is called the inverted L. But because of folding, it assumes what is called a clover leaf model. So as a result of folding, because of three foldings, we are getting just actually four different forms in tRNA molecule. Because of folding, because of three foldings, we are getting what is called four forms in what is called the TR. What are the different types of forms? So normally in a clover leaf model there are four forms. Number one, anticodon form. Number two, amino acid acceptor form. Number three, dehydro form. Dihydrouridine form. Dihydrouridine form. And number three, so number four, P sine C form. P sine C form. So these are all the four forms. In some cases, in addition to these four forms, there is also another form is present. That is called variable form. That is called variable form. So there are four forms because of three foldings. So the number of forms three. The number of forms four. But in some cases we have an extra form is present what is called variable form. But it is not actually present in all cases. At a rare instance we have a variable form. So we have to actually include this variable form also. Now let us go to the different forms in structure. What is the nature? What is anticodon? So if you are taking the anticodon arm, it is actually 5 base pair stem. 
attached to this five base pair stem, we have a loop which contains normally seven nucleotides. I will show the structure. For example, the tRNA for phenyl alanine. The tRNA for phenyl alanine. So, this is the tRNA for phenyl alanine. That means it has the ability of attaching phenyl alanine to its amino acid name. Now, this is the molecular structure of the tRNA. The one which carries the phenyl alanine to the ribosome. Now we are taking place just actually we are talking about this one, what is called the anticodon arm. So this is what we have the anticodon arm. So this anticodon arm is actually formed of a stem. Now this is the stem. And this is the loop. So in the loop we have seven nucleotides. In the stem, you see that one, one, two, three, four, five. 5 base pair stem. This is called 5 base pair stem because we have there are 5 base pairs constituting the stem of this form, what is called adipodal form, having the loop which contains 7 nucleotides. So, out of the 7 nucleotides, there are 3 unpaired bases. You see that one I mentioned here G A A. So, or A G G or A A G. So, AAG, so we are talking about in this direction. So, AAG. So, this is an anticodon for just actually making complementarity for the codon or for recognizing the codon you use. So, the codon you use the mRNA can be recognized and form a complementarity with this anticodon, namely AAG. So, this is anticodon arm which contains a 5 base pairing string and a loop having seven nucleotides. Out of the seven nucleotides, there are three unpaired bases which constitute the anticodon. Here, you see that one AAG, which will join with the codon of mRNA during translation process for translating the message. This is anticodon one. Then, the second one, I am taking the one amino acid acceptor one. So, because these two are oppositely oriented, now this is anticodon arm. Now, this one is amino acid acceptor arm. Amino acid acceptor arm. So, this amino acid acceptor arm has a seven base pair stem. There are seven base pairs: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven base pair stems. So, that base pair stem is made up of actually, you see that one, this is a five terminal nucleotide which forms a base pair with a 3 terminal nucleotide. So this is the 3 terminal nucleotide. This is a 5 terminal nucleotide. They form a base pairing. If you count the number of base pairings, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The stem is formed of 7 base pairs. Then to the 3 terminus, there is a sequence, a group, CCA group. You see that one, this is a CCA group, the one which is surrounded by a red circle with a red. This is what is called CCA group attached to the three terminus. So, the CCA end is called the amino acid attachment site. So, this is amino acid acceptor form. Normally, the amino acid is attached to the CCA end, a sequence, what is called CCA group, that is unpaired nucleotides, not forming a base pair. After this, only we have the base pair. So, the CCA end. To which only actually the amino acid is attached to the hydroxyl group of the CCN of the third terminus. This is amino acid acceptor form. So you have the stem. In addition to the stem, you have additional what is called a group, CCA group, to which only the amino acid is attached. Then the next one. So one is for just actually pairing with the codon of mRNA. And another end is for just actually attachment of amino acid. That is why it's called as an adaptive molecule. So these two ends, namely the amino acid acceptor end and what is called the anticodon end, are oppositely coded. Now I'll take the next one, the D O. It is also called D H O, D H O, or D O. Again, in the case of this D O, we have a stem. The stem is formed of four base pairs. The stem is formed of four base pairs. And then we have the loop that is being formed of eight to ten nucleotides. But in the case of phenylalanine, we have only eight nucleotides. Generally speaking, 
This loop is found of 8 to 10 nuclear tanks, but in the case of DRNA, the one which carries phenyl alanine, it is called phenyl alanine TRN. Phenyl alanine TRN. Simply we can say the TRNA that is amino acyl TRNA. When a particular amino acid is attached, the name is given for TRNA. For example, this one phenyl alanine TRNA. It is able to attach phenyl alanine to its 3 dash terminus. And the amino acid acceptor form. So now this DH form, dihydrouridine. So the D form contains actually a stem formed of four base pairs and a loop. The loop is formed of eight to ten nucleotides, but in tRNA which carries phenyl alanine, it has only eight nucleotides. So in that loop we have what is called pseudouridine, dihydrouridine, otherwise called pseudouridine. The one which is normally developed from what is called uridine base, pseudo uridine or dihydrouridine. So, what is the function of this D ohm? This D ohm is responsible for recognizing the enzyme which activates amino acid. Which activates amino acid. So, this is the ohm responsible for recognizing the enzyme, for example, amino acid synthetase. The one responsible for the activation of amino acid. That is the function of this D. So it is called D ohm because it contains dihydrouridine, a pseudo -uridine. Now coming to the T ohm, the next one, just the one which is oppositely oriented to the D ohm. So it also has a stem. The stem is formed of five base pairs, one, two, three, four, five, and the loop is formed of seven base pairs. Sorry, seven bases, not base pairs. Seven bases are seven nucleotides. Now. In the seven nucleotides, we have a sequence T sin C sequence. That's why it's called T sin O. The sequence T sin C. That's why it's called as actually T sin O or simply it is called T O. T sin C O or simply called as a T O. Just like D H U or D T sin C O or T O. Now, what is the function of this T O? So there are totally seven nucleotides in the loop. There are five base pairs in the stem. Now this is responsible for recognizing the ribosome and also responsible for the binding of tRNA to the ribosome. This ohm is responsible for recognizing the enzyme which activates the amino acid and this ohm is responsible for recognizing the ribosome where is it located and also responsible for the binding of uh, for the binding of is tRNA to the ribosome, then only the translation process is possible. I mentioned already in some cases we have a variable ohm. You see that one, this is an extra ohm. The variable ohm is present in some cases. Now, we through the entire length of uh, the tRNA strand, though it becomes folded, so it has normally modified bases. Here and there we have modified bases. The modification is because of methylation process. So, through the entire length of the tRNA, we have methylated actually the bases. You see that one, 7 methylation, 5 methylation. Actually, the place where the methylation process occurs, the addition of what is called the methyl group occurs. So, through the entire length, normally some of the bases has been modified. And this is because of the methylation process. Here and there you could see there is 2 methylation or just a methylation spine like that. M spine and these are all the places where we have the methylation occurs. So that is happening in the case of TRN. So that is about the molecular structure of a TRNA, the one responsible for carrying the phenyl alanine, the one which has been studied from yeast. So yeast alanine TRNA was the first TRNA. The gene responsible for the yeast alanine TRNA has been normally studied first as synthesized in 1973. So, you have actually two people who have normally synthesized a gene for yeast alanine TR. So, that is about we will see later about the modern genetics. Now, go back to. So, I mentioned the different types of actually the bases with the diagram, the anticodon count, P and pair bases. They constitute what is called that is normally anticodon, which will form a pair with the codon of MR. Okay. Then only the translation process will take place at the complementarity between the codon and anticodon. 
then amino acid accept wrong i mentioned it is formed of seven base pair strip and also one terminus three dash terminus which contains a group what is called cca group to this group only the amino acid is attached so normally i mention only trna specific for an amino acid one trna carries only one amino acid it never carries two amino acids at a time so for example a trna which carries serine will not carry for example methionine a trna which carries for example one amino acid is an example of alanine which cannot carry what is called phenylalanine that is why i mentioned here trna are specific for each amino acid but normally for initiation to take place during translation process we have different stages of translation initiation elongation termination etc for initiation to take place there are certain trnas and those trnas which are taking part in initiation process of translation are called initiated trna for example we have initiated for on a to g so for this one you have u a c this is the initiated codons and decodons so these are all called initiated trna and they are all normally just forming a complementarity or binding or pairing with what is called aeg codon of mrna so for the initiation of the process of translation the protein and there are certain trnas they are called as initiated trna then i mentioned already under the genetic code we have three different types of genetic codes not for not for coding any amino acid they are concerned with only that is termination of protein synthesis or termination of transcription we can say they are all uae uag and ug these codons are called stop codons there are no trnas for such stop codons out of the 64 codons we have we have later number the genetic code in detail there are 64 codons Out of the 64 codons, only 61 codons specify amino acids. The remaining three codons do not specify any amino acids, but they perform the function of termination of transcription process or stopping the transcription process. That's why they are called termination codon or stop codons, as they have no message for no message for what is called amino acids. They are also called as nonsense codons. So. There are no trnas having anti codon for these nonsense codons or stop codons or termination codons. So the termination codons are UAE, UAG, and UGA. These are all the termination codons. There are no trnas just forming a pair with these three codons. That's why I mentioned because there are no trnas for stop codons. They never form a pair with the stop codon. There are no anti codons. in the trna to form a complementarity with these nonsense codons so because of that one act the transcription comes to an end the translation comes to an end because of the exposure of the nonsense codons are stop codons so remember that one there are no trnas for stop codons so i mentioned about the dh etc that's a t sign on where sign is a pseudo uridine the one which is derived from this uridine Okay, and also just in the dehydrogen form, that is dihydrouridine, dihydrouridine. That is why it's called as dehydrogen form, and that one is what is called the sign sign is nothing but pseudo uridine, the one which is derived from what is called the uridine. And I mentioned about the functions also. And normally, I mentioned the methylation process occurs through the length of the trn in some places because of uh, what is called the modifications for carrying out the modification process. And making the trna more stable methylation occurs here and there through the entire length of the trna as i mentioned earlier now this is the structure of this phenylalanine trna now i mentioned about the variable form actually i mentioned about the anti codon as well as uh, that is acceptor form and these two are normally oriented in opposite direction opposite direction so remember that what the anti codon form And the amino acid acceptor form are oriented in opposite directions. Now the next type of RNA, the last one out of the five types, three of them are considered as the major types. Now the ribosomal RNA, as the name implies, you know that one it is found only the ribose. So it constitutes nearly about forty to sixty percent of the total weight of RNA. Sorry, ribosome. It is found in the ribosome, as the name implies. 
and constitutes about nearly 40 to 60 percent of the total dry weight of the ribose. The remaining only protein. You know that when the ribosome is normally formed of RNA and proteins. After the total amount, the weight, 40 to 60 percent being formed of RNA, the RNA, the remaining only you have the proteins and also some enzymes. Now, in total cellular RNA, 5 to 10 percent mRNA, then we have 15 percent tRNA. The remaining 75 to 80 percent is formed by what is called the ribosome of RNA. So, it is the most abundant RNA. It's the most abundant RNA. So, the most abundant RNA, you have this ribosomal RNA. So, out of 100 percent, you see the value. Comparing the value with that of mRNA or tRNA, it is the most abundant. Having just nearly about 75 to 80 percent of the total cellular RNA. And again, which one? Which one of the three RNAs is the most stable form? So it is the most stable, most abundant, most stable. And the virus it produced, it is produced in the nucleus. The ribosomal RNA is normally produced in the nucleus, particularly by the nucleolus. So mRNA is produced by the transcription process by DNA. The tRNA as well as that is ribosomal RNA are produced in the nucleus. The two mainly by the ribosomal RNA, mainly by the nucleus. Now, it is produced in the nucleus, nucleus, and together the nucleus. Its molecular weight is high because its amount is huge in the ribosome, it is about 10 lakh daltons. mRNA 5 lakh daltons, then we have the TRNA 25,000 daltons, and this one 10 lakh daltons. So, it is also higher in its molecular weight when compared to the rest of the two RNAs. And the mRNA is not folded, it is unfolded. The tRNA becomes folded to form a clover leaf model. Here also now the ribosomal RNA becomes folded but doesn't form the clover leaf model, clover leaf structure, but it forms some pseudohelices like this. Pseudohelices. It doesn't form actually exact folding, but it becomes somehow folded to form helices, pseudohelices. These are all called pseudohelices, false helices. Unlike the helix of the DNA, it forms pseudohelices. Here and there also some of the pairing also taking place between the bases. Here and there, that is why they are called pseudohelices. Now, what do you make heterogeneous nuclear form? I mentioned already just in the case of eukaryotic genes. The eukaryotic gene is called the split gene. The eukaryotic gene is called the split gene. What is the meaning of split gene? So, the split gene normally contains coding sequences as well as non-coding sequences. Suppose this is actually the DNA, the split gene. You can see the split gene only in the case of eukaryotic genes, not in the case of prokaryotic gene. So, a split gene consists of both coding and non-coding sequences. The coding sequence is the one which will be expressed. The non-coding sequence is the one which will not be expressed. Now, suppose for example, the coding sequences of a, that is a DNA are called exon. Suppose I am taking this one. I am using the word E for exons. So, I represented E. I represented E. And that letter represents nothing but what is called exons, the coding sequence. That means they have the message. That message has been normally just transcribed, which is later being translated to form a protein. In addition to these exons, there are certain non-coding sequences, and these non-coding sequences, stretches of DNA which cannot be expressed, are called introns. Such a gene is called split gene. When the gene is normally transcribed, we have in the mRNA both the exons and introns being transcribed. Both wanted and unwanted segments of DNA normally have been transcribed in mRNA. Now, this mRNA, before being processed, having both the coding and non coding sequences is called heterogeneous nuclear RNA. An RNA, the pre mRNA, we can see before being processed having both the coding and non-coding sequences. So, it is being transcribed by what is called the split gene. So, here that is what is given. What is heterogeneous nuclear? Heterogeneous means different. 
So it is a transcript, of, actually it is transcript from the split digits, the eukaryotic things, having exons and neutrons. So it is nothing but pre-mRNA. What is the pre-mRNA? Before it is being actually nature, before it is being processed. So what do, you, what do you mean by processing? So during processing what will happen? The unwanted segments of mRNA normally have been removed. The coding sequences are joined together. So a pre-mRNA, the one which has both the exons and introns, the coding and non-coding sequences is called what is known as heterogeneous RNA, otherwise called as pre-mRNA before it is been processed. During processing, the unwanted segments have been removed. Just the segments having the sequences for coding are being joined together. And that before that process, it is called pre-mRNA. After that process, then it is called it is matured RNA. After processing has been completed, once the unwanted segments have been removed, the unwanted segments have been united, then the resultant RNA is called a matured RNA or mRNA. And before that one, before maturation, before processing, the same mRNA has been named as heterogeneous nuclear RNA. So I mentioned already the unwanted regions, namely the introns. So the unwanted regions from HF RNA, namely the heterogeneous nuclear RNA, have been removed. Then we have the regions coding for amino acids have been united. This process of removal of exons, so this process of removal of introns, and then after that the union of just what is called exons is called splicing. Otherwise called gene splicing. The removal of introns and joining of exons, which are coding for amino acids, to form a mature RNA, namely the messenger RNA, that phenomenon is called gene splicing. And actually that splicing process is brought about by some RNA protein complexes. What are the structures responsible for cutting these unwanted segments and joining the useful segments? This is because of structure and RNA just a protein complex. When RNA protein complex is responsible for doing the process of splicing. As it is doing the process of splicing, that protein complex with RNA is called spliceosomes. In that one, we have some 23 just actually as RNA, which is acting as a catalyst, acting as an enzyme for cutting that process. So here, an RNA is acting as a catalyst, doing the process of cutting up unwanted RNA. So anyway, normally the splicing, the gene splicing is directed by RNA protein complex. That RNA protein complex is plesiosomes that removes normally the complementary basis of intron and joining only that is exons together and that phenomenon is called gene splicing brought about by spliceosomes a protein RNA complex then what do you mean by just actually small nuclear RNA and in some cases actually particularly in the spliceosomes we have an RNA which does the role of catalytic function which does the role of catalytic function doing the enzymatic activity such RNAs which are normally responsible for cleaving the RNAs acting as a catalyst are called ribozymes. Ribozymes are nothing but RNA molecule which acts as an enzyme during the process of removing, so doing some catalytic function. So that is why the enzyme, ribozymes, RNA acting as an enzyme doing the process of catalyst, doing the process of catalyst, that is doing the catalytic function. So, the small nuclear RNA, nothing but small segment of RNA found in the spliceosomes doing the process of splicing and doing the activity of what is called catalyst. And such RNAs are called small nuclear RNA or SN RNA found in the spliceosomes. Now, once again, I want to go back to split or interrupted gene. The split genes are also called interrupted genes. It is found only in eukaryotes and no such genes in the case of prokaryotes. No such split condition is seen. That means a split gene is the one having both introns and exons, coding sequences and the non-coding sequences. So what is a split or interrupted gene? As normally the coding sequences is being interrupted by the non-coding sequences, the gene is called interrupted gene. 
So it is a gene normally contains a section of DNA called exons, which are expressed either as RNA and later as protein. Those sequence of DNA, a stretch of DNA, which can be transcribed into RNA and then translated to form proteins are called exons. That is nothing but stretches of DNA having the message. So, which are expressed? They have the message to form RNA, which later translated to form proteins and such regions are called exons. And in between the exons, that's why it's called interrupted gene. So, these exons are interrupted by non-coding sequences of DNA, a stretch of DNA, which doesn't have any code or message for protein synthesis. They are called introns and they cannot be expressed. They can be removed by process what I mentioned, the splicing process. And who are the persons responsible for actually the discovery of such genes? So the eukaryotic interrupted genes as split genes were independently discovered by two different people. One, Richard J. Roberts, another one, Flip A. Short. These were the two people just normally discovered the split gene or interrupted gene in the case of eukaryotes in 1977 independently. So if you are taking actually the human gene or in the case of for example, generally speaking, let's take first human gene. So in the case of human genes, 94 percent of the human genes are interrupted. That means having both wanted and unwanted sequences of DNA. Stupid fellows are always present along with you know that one here the stupid fellows are more than that of the normal persons. So we have 94% of human genes are interrupted genes. That means having both exons and introns. Only 6% alone having only the coding sequence with genes. The remaining 94% are split genes having both exons and introns. Both are being transcribed after which the mRNA or pre or heterogeneous nuclear RNA they are being spliced out. And then after which we are just joining the coding sequences to form a mature RNA which is being translated to form a protein. Once again I want to discriminate exons and introns. So, and those stretches of DNA in a eukaryotic gene that normally code for amino acids. So, stretches of bases of DNA, a segment of DNA or stretches of bases, or stretches of nucleotides, we can say either way, a segment of DNA, stretches of DNA, stretches of bases, and then also, just actually stretch of, stretches of nucleotides. They have the code for amino acids. Such part of the gene are called exons. You can see exons and introns only you can do this, don't forget this one. And what do you mean by introns? The stretches of bases, or the nucleotides or a segment of DNA, particularly eukaryotic genes, normally that do not code for amino acids. Those segments of DNA that code for amino acids are called exons, and those segments of DNA that do not code for that is normally amino acids are called introns. And normally in a eukaryotic gene, it's called split gene, the exons are interrupted, inserted along with here and there, along with their form, that is why it's called interrupted gene. So, during the process of maturation or processing of mRNA or HH, heterogeneous nuclear RNA, that part has been removed. Sometimes what will happen, there is a splicing error. So, the interrupt genes have not been spliced out properly, then it is called splicing error. One such splicing error results in disease, for example, thalassemia. So, thalassemia disease is because of the splicing error, when the introns are not have been spliced out properly. We have a phenomenon what is called splicing error that results in the development of a disease. One such example, thalassemia. Now the split G. I mentioned just what we have, symbol one. We have more about this one once again under the transcription process. See, this is what is called the split G. Having just one intron and two exons. Now the black colored one, the shaded one is a non-coding sequence, we don't want that one unwanted film. So during transcription what will happen, we have formed what is called first pre-mRNA containing both exon introns in the pre-mRNA. Then what will happen in the pre-mRNA, 
free mRNA, the unwanted gene that is intron has been spliced out. That process is called splicing, so that we can get what is called the mature mRNA or processed mRNA. So the support split gene. We'll talk about more about actually the molecular basis of the inheritance in the forthcoming classes as the time has been passed more than 7 o'clock, 4 minutes past 7, and concluding my part. So, if you're ready to ask any questions, post the questions, we're ready to answer. Now, the class is coming.